two of the most baffling unsolved mysteries from the ancient world. First, who was the evil Pharaoh that went up against Moses in the biblical story of Exodus over 3,000 years ago? Second, who murdered Ramses III, the last great Pharaoh of Egypt and one of the most powerful men on earth at that time? I intend to prove in the course of the next few minutes that these two seemingly separate events are actually two sides of the same coin. The story of Exodus in the Bible is just a Jewish version, and the story of the death of Ramses III is merely the Egyptian version of the same story. By bringing these two stories together, we're going to solve this puzzle at last. This new theory is sure to astound the Jewish people, Egyptologists, historians, biblical scholars, and the Egyptians. Not so much because it presents new evidence, but rather because it successfully puts together the pieces that were right in front of us all along. Probably sounds hard to believe, but give me a few minutes and I will bring you an avalanche of evidence, evidence which I think in my mind no court could deny. If you like murder mysteries, sit back and hold on to your seats because this is the greatest of them all. The first part of our story begins with the pharaoh Ramses III. After a brief review of his life in ancient Egypt, we'll move ahead to the biblical legend of Moses and reveal how these two separate stories are actually interconnected. And if you don't already know, this is a story to end all stories. In my mind, it's one of the greatest spectacles in the entire history of the human race. It has everything. Just listen to these real historical events that all happen in the Eastern Mediterranean region all at the same time. The crash of empires, volcanic winters, earthquakes, storms, droughts, plagues, famine, assassinations and executions, eclipses, black magic, a prophet of God, an arch villain bent on mayhem, tens of thousands of slaves running for their lives from a madman, and a final battle scene that would put any Hollywood movie to shame. I'm going to tell you a story that you will never, ever forget. It took 3,000 years for the mummy of Ramses III to be found in 1886, but no one knew that it was hiding a big secret. The linen bandages that the Egyptian embalmers had wrapped around the dead pharaoh were so tight and so unusually thick that the scientists couldn't unwrap him. In 2012, Egyptologists finally found what his secret is. A CAT scan revealed, to the amazement of everyone involved, that the throat of this powerful pharaoh had been slit to the bone, killing him almost instantly. And until today, no one knows who did it or why. Official Egyptian records from the time, written just before the end of Ramsey's murder, claim that there had been a failed assassination attempt on his life, and they named three dozen or so defendants, along with their crimes and their gruesome punishments. It was a huge scandal, and it must have rocked ancient Egypt who was busy thanking their sun god Ra for protecting the pharaoh and foiling the plot against him. And yet, 3,000 years later, his mummy clearly showed evidence that he'd been brutally murdered. How could this be? Some researchers say that the assassination must have been successful, but that's not what the records say. The Egyptian investigation of the crime was organized by Pharaoh Ramses III himself. It was he who picked the judges. It was he who gave them their orders, while thanking the gods for protecting him from harm. How can a murdered Pharaoh organize his own murder trial? To make things more interesting, when the actual trials began a short while later, his son Ramses IV is now suddenly on the throne and Ramses III is never heard from again. What a mystery. If the assassination attempt had failed, 
then why is his son suddenly on the throne now, and why is Ramses III referred to as a dead pharaoh by the time the trial begins, with no explanation? If the assassination had been successful, then how could he have commented on the assassination attempt and personally chosen the judges for the trial? Some people said that maybe he'd only been injured in the assassination attempt and died later after organizing the trial. But the CAT scan changed all that because a slit throat to the bone means virtually instant death. Something else must have happened. Something that had to be kept a secret. The Egyptian records are totally silent about how Ramses III died. Nothing was ever recorded, not even in later decades or centuries. Nothing has been found on the temple walls or the written texts, which are extensive. They even wrapped a linen shawl around the mummy's neck to hide the three-inch gash that had cut to his bone and killed him instantly. His killers, and we do know that there were multiple attackers because different weapons were found to have been used on him. They had also chopped off the big toe of his right foot, which forced the embalmers later to put a fake toe on his foot before wrapping it and dousing it with glue, as if they didn't want the gods of resurrection to know what happened. Why? Because the Egyptians believed that only a whole and unblemished body could be resurrected. The Egyptians were meticulous record keepers, renowned as the best in the ancient world. So then, why did they hide how Ramses III died? And what about the story of the Exodus itself? Why was it never mentioned anywhere in their extensive records? Stranger still, why didn't the biblical writers mention the Pharaoh's name? There are many names in the book of Exodus. Whole families are listed that are totally irrelevant to the story. And yet, the identity of the main antagonist arch-villain that would be remembered for thousands of years as the bitter enemy of Moses and the whole Jewish race is never named. Why? Some say that it's because the Exodus never happened, but we have found Egyptian records of slave trading and more than half of the names listed are Jewish. As far as the Jewish people themselves, they certainly have no doubts. 3,000 years of religion, governmental laws, holidays, and customs of an entire nation and race are founded on this event. The Jewish calendar was created specifically in such a way as to revolve around the date of the Exodus. That is not something that can ever come from a mere made-up fantasy. Something extraordinarily definitely did happen and most scholars agree. The trouble with finding the answer is that nobody even knows when Moses lived, which means that we don't know when the Exodus happened, not even which century. Various theories point to different dates throughout a 400 year span, from 1100 BC to 1500 BC. But there were dozens of pharaohs during that time. We're going to figure it out through science and some detective work. If we assume that the Exodus story was based on certain real events that became embellished in time, as most researchers claim, then there should be a murdered pharaoh somewhere in Egyptian history. Here's the gist of the biblical tale. There is a cruel pharaoh that lived in troubled times, thousands of desperate Jewish slaves, the hero of Moses, who brought the ten plagues to Egypt as a sign from God, an escape of the slaves into the desert, who were then pursued by the Pharaoh and his army, and finally the death of the Pharaoh and the journey of the Israelites toward the Promised Land. If the Pharaoh and his army had been killed by the Red Sea crashing in on them and drowning them all, like it says in the Bible, then at least there should be records of a pharaoh that had suddenly disappeared and was never entombed. 
but that never happened. If they had all been killed in battle, and the Bible does say that the Israelites left, quote-unquote, prepared for battle, then there should be records about a murdered Pharaoh. So that is the next obvious place to look, the Egyptian records about their kings. One of the only clues from the Bible says that the Hebrew slaves built the city of P. Ramses in honor of Ramses II, the greatest of all pharaohs, who ruled around 1200 BC. He was probably the grandfather of Ramses III. Whoever the Exodus pharaoh was, he had to come, therefore, after 1200 BC. Only two male pharaohs were ever murdered, Pharaoh Sekinenra II and Pharaoh Ramses III, who, as we said earlier, had his throat slit. But Sekinenra lived around 1600 BC, way before the generally accepted date of the Exodus, and we know that since the slaves built the city of Pre-Ramses, it had to be sometime after 1200 BC, which rules out Sekinenra. That leaves Ramses III, one of the most important pharaohs of ancient Egypt, and there is a lot of controversy about how this particular man died. So now we have at least a potential suspect, Ramses III, known as the last great pharaoh of Egypt, about whom practically everything is known except who killed him and why. Let's review the time that he lived in, based on what is known by science. Does it match the times of the biblical pharaoh with all the chaos and death? The Egyptian empire, proud and practically ageless, is falling apart at the seams during the reign of Ramses III. No pharaoh in Egyptian history had ever dealt with what he was now facing. All at once, he was managing multiple defensive wars in different areas of Egypt to keep out masses of desperate, marauding refugees, while he was simultaneously dealing with financial collapse, treason, droughts, failed crops, starvation, shortages, and the first labor strike in recorded history. Meanwhile, at his luxurious temple palace in Thebes, modern Luxor, the situation was even worse. The great pharaoh, who was literally worshipped as a god on earth, had just survived an assassination attempt on his life by none other than his own wife and son. Dozens of people from his own court were involved in this unprecedented act of treason, including some of his closest advisors. It was a scandal to end all scandals, and all of Egypt was in shock. Ramses appointed a dozen of his most trusted servants to judge the case, and then, inexplicably, he gave them full authority to be judge, jury, and executioner, something which was usually the pharaoh's job alone. Nobody knows why. The judges found the assassins and their accomplices guilty, and his traitorous son was forced to commit suicide along with many of the others. The alternative to suicide was to be burned alive and have their ashes scattered on the roads for donkeys to walk on. To have no body left after death to these ancient people meant that there could never be an afterlife, as the Egyptians had believed with full conviction for thousands of years. Your body needed to stay intact if you're going to go to heaven. Which explains why they spent so much time and effort in preserving their pharaoh's bodies, identifying them, and putting them in secure sites until Resurrection Day. Other guilty parties in this assassination and plot probably considered themselves lucky to have had only their ears and noses cut off. Also, being robbed of going to heaven that way. But now, suddenly, Ramses III himself is dead just before the trial begins, mutilated like a street criminal. And no one wants to talk about it. Our own researchers have to make things up to make sense of it, saying things like maybe the Egyptians were just pretending or imagining that their king was opening the investigation into his own murder trial. 
There's a missing link there, a huge gap, a mysterious and inexplicable silence. A lot of people say that the Exodus never happened because the Egyptians never mention it, but that is a terrible read on the situation. The royal records were there to glorify the Pharaoh and all his wonderful deeds, not to count his failures, much less talk about his near beheading at the hands of slaves. What survives from the imperial court of the Egyptian empire is pure propaganda, not historical record keeping. To expect the story of Moses and Exodus to show up on their records is to misunderstand the purpose of those records in the first place. We should actually be deliberately looking for a missing gap somewhere. By the end of this presentation, you will understand that the name of that gap is the prophet Moses. But let's not jump ahead. Let's do a quick review of the 10 plagues that Moses and God reportedly brought upon Egypt. Does the state of Egyptian life during the reign of Ramses III have any similarity to the biblical story? Or are we just wasting our time? The plagues were water turning to blood, frogs, lice, flies, livestock, pestilence, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and a lot of dead children, including the Pharaoh's own son. Egypt was in desperate shape, and it was never the same afterward. Where are any of these kinds of disasters happening during the reign of Ramses III, our one and only potential suspect? Hold on to your seats. Yes, all of them. This powerful pharaoh is connected by scientists and Egyptologists the world over to what's called the Late Bronze Age Collapse, a very sudden and catastrophic climate change which resulted in the decimation of the entire Mediterranean region, destroying many ancient and powerful empires forever. These scientists blame many of the problems of Egypt during Ramses III's reign as directly emanating from this collapse. Could these catastrophic natural events be the 10 plagues of Egypt? Whole cities vanished during this time, either from earthquakes, famine, war, or all of the above. No one is sure. All we know is that there was a systemic failure across the board throughout the entire region. I would call it the ancient world's Armageddon because I'm sure that's how those people viewed the unbelievable number of disasters simultaneously happening decade after decade. The entire ancient world saw everything that happens as the doings of the gods. There was no science back then. There was only ignorance and attempts to describe all the wonders of life in some magical way. The river flowed because of the river spirit. The storm came because of the storm god, the volcano erupted because the volcano god was angry. You couldn't have a child because the goddess of fertility hadn't been pleased by your sacrifices and offerings. And the crops could only fail because the god of vegetation had been displeased for whatever reason. Nothing happened by chance. In our time, we control our environment through knowledge and science. They, on the other hand, believe that the environment could be controlled by somehow coaxing the right God to do what they wanted. And that happened by manipulating these gods through certain formulas and rituals involving secret magic spells, or what we would call today voodoo, as well as human and animal sacrifices, special gifts left at the feet of stone statues, prayers, penance, and endless ceremonies conducted by the priests. This was their version of science, and they were absolutely sure that it worked, from the lowly workers all the way up to the pharaohs themselves. Around this time in Egypt, the so-called king of the gods, Amun-Ra, was believed to be responsible for pulling the sun across the sky. He pulled the sun across the sky by carrying it on his crown as he sailed east to west on his magical boat in the river in the sky. At night, 
The sun god was thought to have gone down into the underworld along with other gods to do battle with the god of the underworld. And it was not at all certain or a given that the sun would come up again in the morning. Each night the priests would pray for the success of their god and each day they would honor him for winning once again and bringing life to our world. Nothing in their view was automatic. Keep this in mind when we explore another epic natural disaster that, believe it or not, is also known to have happened during the reign of Ramses III. It's called Hecla III and is considered one of history's four most powerful volcanic eruptions. A supervolcano that caused was called a volcanic winter. This eruption is known as Hecla III. It threw nearly seven and a half cubic kilometers of volcanic rock into the atmosphere and covered the sky in a dark shroud of dust that would have lasted for years after the event. In Ireland, studies done on bog oaks, those are trees half fossilized in marshy waters, have shown that for 18 years after the eruption of Hecla III, the trees barely grew at all. Across the Atlantic in the United States, bristlecone pines the oldest living trees on Earth still show similar records of this time of darkness and cooling, which seems to have lasted about two decades. And the effect on our region would have been dramatic. Crops would have failed, soils would have blown away, and more than that, the dark cloud that seemed to hang over the sun would have spoken to people of something dreadful on its way, a punishment from the gods, and perhaps even the end of the world. As people looked up and saw the sun only a pale white through the haze, they must have asked, what did we do wrong? Why have our gods forsaken us? So let's see what's known about the climate change of the late Bronze Age collapse, when it's mixed in with the eruption of the Hecla III. Look at how the entire area was decimated like dominoes. First, the massive volcanic eruption in Iceland would have turned down the temperatures across Europe some 5 to 10 degrees for years. This would have caused crop failure on mass levels and forced a lot of desperate people to head south looking for warmer temperatures and food. This would explain why the so-called sea peoples, who caused so much damage and destruction to the civilizations around the eastern Mediterranean, they're not military units, but rather a conglomeration of different people from faraway places traveling by boat with their wives, children, and their belongings. Next, the lower temperature would cool down the Mediterranean Sea, causing the regular evaporation rate of the sea to plummet. Less precipitation would mean less rain, which would mean drought. Drought leads to crop failure and a lot of starvation. That creates mass migrations, wars, and general chaos on every level. We have records from various rulers in the area begging for help and food because the situation was so desperate. They were afraid that their entire population would perish. This, along with the marauding invaders, went on for decades until some of these powerful civilizations were wiped out for good. In Egypt, besides getting invaded by a lot of hungry hordes from all around, the situation would lead to a drying up of the Nile in spots, as well as its tributary rivers. The once mighty Nile, always dependable, would change from a flowing body of water to patches of still water. That still water would become warm and the red algae would grow rapidly and make the water toxic to make it look blood red in what's called a red tide. The now toxic water would be undrinkable, the fish would die, and the river would stink just as the Bible says. The shock to the river would cause a rapid increase of frogs leaving the water, which would then die everywhere. They've actually done tests and proven that tadpoles grow twice as fast when exposed to stress. Next, the still water would become a magnet for mosquitoes and insects looking for a place to lay their eggs. 
and since their natural predators, frogs and fish, are no longer around, there would be a massive infestation of insects. Mosquitoes would carry disease everywhere now, especially malaria. Both people and animals would die in droves from hunger, thirst, and various diseases. Plagues. The attack of the insects on an already weakened population would cause openings in their skin, which would allow the bacteria to enter the body. A bump forms as pus collects under the skin and it becomes a boil. The plot, ladies and gentlemen, thickens. There was also supposed to be a period of darkness before the exodus, such darkness that people couldn't see each other and no one left their homes out of fear. It's obviously an eclipse, but near complete darkness can only be caused by a total eclipse of the sun. It wouldn't have lasted three days like the biblical account. Eclipses only last for a couple of minutes, but the description fits the bill, so it should be researched. Why were the people afraid of eclipses? It wasn't due to the rotation of planetary bodies as we know today, but because the god of the underworld sometimes made a surprise daytime attack on the sun god, Ra, and tried to devour him. Imagine the fear that an eclipse would create for these highly superstitious people in those distant times. They couldn't be sure that the sun would ever come back until the eclipse ended, showing that Amun-Ra had won the battle and all was well once again. Was there an eclipse during the reign of Ramses III? Inquiring minds want to know. I found after some research that on August 19th of 1156 BC, an eclipse did indeed occur. What's more, the path goes right over the Nile Delta, which means that the Egyptians would have seen a total or near total eclipse of the sun, something that only happens in the same area once in a century at best. The date of this eclipse would put it eight months before the death of Ramses III, within that famous last year before the actual exodus. We can see that the biblical account of the plagues does indeed match point by point to natural disasters during the time of Ramses III. We also know that he was the quote unquote last great pharaoh of Egypt and that Egypt rapidly declined after him to the point where in just a few decades it was broken up into several pieces and no native Egyptian would rule the country again for ages. We also need to know if there is a character match between the biblical Pharaoh and Ramses III, because that is a big part of the story. A lot of the researchers say, okay, these stories were exaggerated or embellished, but they completely throw away everything. That's not how stories turn into legends and legends turn into myths. There is a kernel of truth to the story itself. Does the character of Ramses III match what we're told about the Exodus Pharaoh, who, along with his forefathers, took such bitter advantage of thousands of innocent souls, made them slaves, practiced infanticide, refused to free them, and destroyed their lives, as told in the Bible? Was he really that evil? Ramses III was born and bred to be a pharaoh. His father and grandfather were pharaohs. Three of his sons became subsequent pharaohs. His family ruled Egypt during its golden age for over a hundred years. Certainly, the breeding ground is right for an entitled, pompous, and callous leader. If we add the religious angle, and remember, that he was told that he is literally a god on earth and was worshipped from the time of his birth, then one can easily imagine the kind of person that that can produce. There is no need for using imagination, however, because there are plenty of clues about the sort of man he was 
from known historical records. Ramses III is known to have been responsible for the first labor strike in recorded history. In this unprecedented event, the pharaoh's own temple builders and artists went on strike and refused to work. Why? Because they were paid with food but had remained unpaid for weeks. These artisans, highly skilled, were respected members of society. They were walled off from the rest of Egypt and lived an exclusive life, probably handling their skills down one generation after another in a well-knit and stable community. They did the important work of decorating and writing on the temple walls, building the temples, etc., which was very much needed if the pharaoh was to be remembered and resurrected later. In other words, these were the last people that a pharaoh would want to rob of their pay. What's important about this event, however, is that when we scratch beneath the surface a little, we have to conclude that Egypt was now destitute and desperate at this point. If the illustrious, educated, and respected artisans at Deir el Medina were denied pay, then what was the average Egyptian facing? What's more, what were the slaves facing? The labor strikes then shows that there was mass desperation and starvation going on in Egypt. Ramses III had managed to keep the Sea Peoples out, but all those wars had cost enormous sums, and along with the natural disasters all around, the state's grain supply was seriously depleted. Egypt was starving. What else can we glean about the character of Ramses III? Looking at the harem conspiracy, which happened just a couple of years after the labor strike, we can discover more about this pharaoh's corrosive personality. Egyptologists usually call this time a troubled period for Ramses and for Egypt. But when we look a little closer, it shows that it was a lot worse than just troubled. It was apocalyptic. Remember how there was an assassination attempt on his life just before he was murdered. Well, what's fascinating is the details of this coup attempt. It wasn't executed by military leaders and soldiers, as one would expect. The plot was hatched and carried out by a very unlikely group of people. There were multiple women in his harem involved, including one of Ramsey's wives, his son, a police chief, several guards, a military commander, a magician, scribes, official butlers and attendants, and even the person who served him food and drink. Why would harem girls and butlers and waiters be involved in killing their lord? Why would almost 40 people of his own court be involved? Some of the accused were the guards at the harem who heard the plot but said nothing, as well as their wives What's in it for these people that they would risk their lives for it? All the details about the plot aren't known, but what is known is that they were trying to kill Ramses through what we would call voodoo, by having the court magician create wax figures that would somehow incapacitate the guards and kill the pharaoh. It was a silly plan in our modern eyes, but to them and the Egyptians as a whole, the power of black magic was all too real and deadly. This is a time when black magic was believed to be able to cast a spell and turn a tiny wax figurine into a giant crocodile, or turn wooden staffs into snakes, or part water. Egypt was obsessed with magic. The conspirators were also simultaneously sending secret messages through the court guards to people outside the temple walls, asking them to riot while they attempted their coup. In fact, 
Ramses III was the only pharaoh that had to build an outer protective wall to safe keep his temple, showing you the times that he lived in. It also shows us something else about Ramses, that he was really hated, even at his home. If there are doubts, they're erased when we're told by these same papyrus records that out of the dozen judges that Ramses III himself selected for the trial, three of them were caught sympathizing with the conspirators, as well as two of the guards who were protecting those judges. These judges were supposed to be the trusted and hand-picked people set up by Ramses III himself. What's going on here? His wife and son hate him and want him dead, along with a lot of people in his own palace, his most trusted servants and advisors, while the people outside are clamoring for blood. And what kind of a mood was out there in the streets outside the temple that the conspirators believed they could incite a riot on the spot? You can't whip up a riot outside unless the people are desperate and ready to resort to violence to bring change. These facts can only mean that people believe Ramses III himself was the source of all of Egypt's troubles and that he had to go if the nation was to be saved from a sorry plight. Yet another character reveal comes from the fact that the assassination attempt had happened during the said festival an extravagant celebration that happened only after a pharaoh had ruled for 30 years, something that was very rare. Most pharaohs ruled only for a few years. No expense was spared. The first set festival was after 30 years and then every three years thereafter. The first and main festival took place around the time of the labor strike. No wonder people were so angry. This was a huge and very expensive celebration that glorified the monarch himself. And Ramses III went right ahead with it while Egypt was in chaos and his people, even his own artisans, were starving. The French Revolution comes to mind here, with an out-of-touch ruler and a starving population getting more desperate by the hour. What's clear is that he wasn't going to allow the mere death and starvation of the population whom he was supposed to protect as part of his divine duty in doing the ma'at to stop him from throwing an extravagant party for himself at whatever expense to others. These facts, which are well known but never analyzed in depth, reveal a vicious, cruel, an uncaring king. He was the opposite of what a true pharaoh was supposed to be, and it appears that his people knew it. What kind of a king lets his own people starve while he spends lavishly to glorify himself? What kind of a pharaoh, famed for building, lets his own builders to go hungry while he parties? What kind of a king is wanted dead by his own family, his closest advisors, and attending staff to the point that they would risk their lives to kill him? Is it the kind of king that would carry out infanticide on slaves? Is it the kind that would tell them to get their own straw for making mud bricks, punishing them more when they cry out that they're stretched to the limit? Yes. It is. Incidentally, do you remember those black and white horror movies about mummies that came back to life? When the producers were looking for a prototype mummy for their movies in the 20s and 30s, they looked around to see who is the scariest mummy of them all. And guess who they chose? That's right, our own Ramses III. You can see the unusual wrapping around his neck in those movies. The man is still scaring people 3,000 years after he died. <coughs> those producers didn't even know, back in the 1930s, that they had fashioned their mummy after the Exodus Pharaoh, or that his throat 
had been cut. You couldn't make this stuff up. When the tomb with Ramsey's mummy was found, there was another mummy in the tomb with him, and it was very unusual. He was a young man, around 18 to 20, that was wrapped in sheepskin, signifying an impure person. It meant that he had done something very bad. Wrapping him with sheepskin was a form of punishment because they believed that it would deny him an afterlife. He had no name either, which was another necessity for an afterlife recognition. He became known as the Screaming Mummy, or Mummy E, and for a long time no one knew who he was. Only recently, DNA testing showed that he was indeed the son of Ramses III, who had been forced to commit suicide after trying to assassinate his father. The signs on his neck show signs of hanging. One of the last remaining of the so-called plagues that afflicted the pharaoh, which we have not covered yet, was the death of his son. It's actually one of the most recognizable, iconic images from the Exodus story. The pharaoh of Egypt, with his kingdom in chaos, loses his son just before he tells Moses and the slaves to leave. It's possible to see how the assassination attempt, as well as the death, of the son of Ramses III could be viewed as yet more plagues from the God of Moses. At the time that the judges were being selected for the trial, Ramses would have already known that his son was as good as dead. He could have met Moses in his palace one last time before the Exodus, just as the Bible tells the story, when the fate of his son would have been known to him and to Moses, who was just about to escape with the slaves. Here is a picture of Dr. Hawass standing over the mummy of Ramses III and his son, Pentaware, still pictured together after 3,200 years. I've read that he doesn't believe in the Exodus story. And here he's standing directly over the Exodus Pharaoh and his dead son not realizing it. To recap, the biblical plagues have been matched. The wars and general chaos in Egypt, the water turning to blood, the frogs, insects, smelly and undrinkable water, pestilence, plagues, boils, darkness, and the death of the Pharaoh's son have all been matched. And the natural disasters are an obvious the scientifically recognized consequence of the Bronze Age collapse and the Hecla III eruption. At this point, I would be prepared to rest my case, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. But as Lieutenant Colombo always said, there's just one more thing. It's the acid test. There's just one other thing that needs to go through the process of elimination that is, the time of Ramsey's death. What I'm proposing would do well on its own, but there's one other point that can bring it all crashing down. You see, we have an exact date for Ramsey's murder. His son, Ramsey's IV, recorded exactly how many days his father was in power. 31 years and 41 days. Now, the story goes that the Hebrew slaves had to lay low during Passover and then escaped Egypt before being hotly pursued by the vindictive Pharaoh and his small army and 600 of his best chariots. What can we learn from this? We learn that the Passover must have occurred around the same time as Ramses III's death. The slaves escaped the next day they're being chased, and the Pharaoh dies. Therefore, the time of the Passover, religiously handed down for thousands of years, must be around the same time as Ramses III's death. Since we know exactly the period of the Passover, which is celebrated two to four weeks after the first day of spring, and we also know the exact date of Ramses' murder, then they cannot be far from each other. If they are, 
there's a problem with this theory. They have to match. Ramsey's date of death is recorded as April 15th, 1155 BC. I will never forget how, upon realizing that the dates must match, asked Google, when is Passover this year? The answer to my astonishment was April 15th, 2022. What are the odds? What are the odds? That would mean that the Exodus happened exactly 3,177 years before this year's Passover and that the Israelites escaped the ancient capital of Egypt, Thebes, modern Luxor, as one would expect. That's where the pyramids were, that's where all the construction was, that's where the slaves were needed. And uh, so they weren't in Goshen, it was in Thebes. If it's true that Moses was already over 80 years old when the Exodus happened, then we can also date his birth to roughly 1275 BC, which was around the end of the reign of Ramses II, just as scholars suspect. It's only by putting the story of Ramses III together with the biblical story of Moses that all the pieces fall into place and the mystery unravels perfectly. Why did the Egyptians never talk about the Exodus or the murder of their pharaoh? Because it was not only highly embarrassing, but you have to keep in mind that this period was also the beginning of the battle between ancient polytheism or paganism and the newly emerging idea about there being only one god, monotheism. This battle for religious dominance between polytheism and monotheism would rage for the next 1600 years before it was abolished for good by Constantine. So the Exodus wasn't just an embarrassment to the Egyptian national pride, but it was a dagger in the heart of their religious pride. Moses' God had beaten Amun-Ra and Osiris, and that hurt. This was a nation that was still trying to recover from one of their own pharaohs, Akhenaten, who just a couple of centuries earlier had abolished all the mighty gods of Egypt, gotten rid of them all, and said that there's only one god. The priests of Egypt, after this Akhenaten pharaoh died, tried to do everything they could to erase his memory, unsuccessfully. But here's the one god again, throwing Egypt into chaos, freeing their slaves, tearing their country apart with natural disasters, and murdering the pharaoh of Egypt. How were they to make sense of this? When a people's religious convictions are challenged, they're faced with the possibility that everything they've believed and taught for thousands of years is wrong. The immediate response is to ignore it, hide it, and never speak of it again. Brush it under the rug. It should be no surprise whatsoever then that there are no Egyptian records about the Exodus the dead pharaoh, or Moses. Remember, this was a civilization just 1,300 years before Ramses III. They were willing to support 100,000 men working night and day for 20 years with God knows how many people dying just to build a pyramid that would house and identify their mummified pharaoh so that he could rise again. Do you think that this religion had a vice grip on their mentality after thousands of years? Of course. Let's see if putting this puzzle together now answers all the questions and mysteries surrounding this case. Why did the Egyptians write a detailed report about the harem conspiracy and display it at the temple for all to see, but not speak of the actual murder of their pharaoh and the subsequent exodus? Because the assassination had supposedly been thwarted by the sun god Ra, which showed that the Egyptians were in the right and protected by the gods just, that they just as they believed and taught. Why was the actual murder, or Moses, or the exodus of the slaves never mentioned? Very simple, because it taught the opposite. That Egypt and its gods were so weak that they couldn't stop a group of illiterate and untrained slaves to not only escape their grip, but murder their king and show that Akhenaten had been right all along. 
Why did Ramses delegate the trial and execution of the harem conspiracy to others, to other judges when it was really his role? And then suddenly disappear? Because the slaves had obviously escaped during the pandemonium and utter chaos, unprecedented commotion coming from an assassination attempt of the king himself. Along with all the natural disasters, the famine, the plagues, the eclipse, all the problems that were ravaging Egypt, and the set festival. These were all happening at the same time. So of course the, the uh, slaves would use this period to escape, wouldn't you? Of course you would. Ramses III chased them to kill Moses and bring the slaves back as a hero when the whole country wanted him dead. So this was his chance to prove his worth again, to get the people behind him again, and to just uh, get rid of Moses once and for all. Why was Ramses missing a toe? Because just before his death, his killers would have made a point of letting him know that they were going to rob him not only of his life, but also his afterlife. How are they going to do that? By taking a piece of his body off, which would make him unwhole, which would, in his mind, make him ineligible for resurrection. Now, why didn't the biblical writers of the book of Exodus never mention the name of the Pharaoh? That was another thing we were wondering in the beginning. Because, you see, these writers had changed the story to make it more palatable and more impressive to their fellow Jews, so instead of having a battle and victory, they invented the parting of the Red Sea as the cause for the death of the Pharaoh and his army. If they had included the name of the Pharaoh in the story of the Exodus, then the Egyptians and others could simply point to the tomb of Ramses III and say, you know, hey, he's buried right here. He never drowned. And of course, that would have blown up their whole story. So they could not have mentioned his name. You know, in the biblical tale, we're told that during the last meeting between Moses and the Pharaoh in Egypt, the king had had enough of Moses to the point of saying that if they ever met again, it would be the last time they meet. And Moses agreed. They had come to the realization that it had come to blows and that should they ever meet again, one of them was going to die. These meetings would have, by the way, taken place right in that funerary temple of Ramses III. You've seen several pictures of it throughout this presentation. That's where Moses walked, and that's where they met. As the story goes, there would indeed be a final meeting between the arch felon and the hero, and it had to be one of the most incredible scenes in the entire history of humanity. You see, the cut on Ramses III's neck was a straight cut at the base of his throat. Just as you would see in an execution, with the killers holding him from behind while others held him in place. That's why his toe was so cleanly chopped off. People in battle really don't aim for toes. Even if you're already on the ground during battle and you have an axe in your hand, the toe is the last thing you're going to go for. So it would appear that Ramses III had been captured in battle. And of course, they would hold him until Moses could proclaim sentence. You have to understand, these people that must have been there. So just picture the scene of the Pharaoh of Egypt with his army decimated, being held in place in front of thousands, tens of thousands of slaves who had seen their lives ruined by this man, not just their lives, but their fathers and their grandfathers being beaten, being robbed of any happiness, having their bodies broken, dying in absolute pain and misery, generation after generation. And here is Moses in front of his captured Pharaoh, with the volcano erupting in the background. That's why they were following the smoke during the day and the glow of the lava at night because there was an active volcano in the region. So imagine the rumbling of the volcano, tens of thousands of desperate people 
looking at this Pharaoh, who to them must have been the devil himself, being confronted by Moses as he's captured there. What an unbelievable scene. They must have hated him with every molecule in their body. His toe was chopped off as an act of pure spite for all the things that he and his forefathers had done to the Jewish people and many other people. This was a very brutal, brutal regime. We know that this must have happened, this chopping off of the toe, just before he died, because the wound on his toe hadn't even begun to heal. We know that. Scientists have confirmed that. Of course, having his toe chopped off, or any part of his body chopped off, would have been a fate worse than death to Ramses III, the man who started the construction of his funerary services and temples the day he was crowned. So that's 31 years he's been planning for his death, which was really life was seen as a rite of passage to the afterlife. And all of their efforts were built on preparing the Pharaoh for that afterlife. Immediately thereafter, his throat would have been cut, his arteries would have been severed, and it would have been a very bloody, gory scene in front of these thousands of people. You just have to envision this scene. It has to be a Hollywood movie. Now, there's no way to know if it was Moses himself who slit his throat. We know Moses had killed before. He was a general. He was a military man as well as a religious leader. There's no way if he did it himself or if he had one of his lieutenants do it. But we can safely conclude that Ramses III would have been held after he was captured until Moses could be there to pronounce judgment and sentence. So I can say with some certainty, looking at this dead pharaoh from 3200 years ago, that while he may or may not have been killed personally by our hero, the last thing the man saw was the face of Moses. <laughs>